Well, welcome everyone to the final presentation of AHSP 2017. Appreciate everybody who has stayed. Uh, I know there were a lot of trials and tribulations, but it's been a pretty good day today. Looks like it might even be a good night tonight. Our speaker tonight is Becca Lundgren from Smithsonian, the Phoebe Wasserman Observatory. She's one of the outreach people there, and uh, she is one of a, a, a string of very good speakers we've had who've come to uh, AHSP from all kinds of departments. Of course, we had a speaker a couple nights ago who was also from Smithsonian. Uh, they've been very good to us by coming up and joining with us and uh, giving us some updates. Becca's gonna talk about uh, women in astronomy. Uh, that's uh, a topic that is somewhat close to my heart, partially because my wife is sort of an astronomer by training, but also minor factoid I am the first male to have received a Wellesley ID since World War II because I was taking classes at Wellesley in astronomy because they were better than the classes at MIT as far as descriptive astronomy. So um, that was a case where I had the reverse of being the only male in a class of all women and get the, get the feel for what it's like for the women who have to tolerate the same thing with a bunch of men. And, in the science class. So with that, I'll turn it over. This is not about me. I'll turn it over to Becca, who will give you. us a presentation. Thank you Please so welcome much. her. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for having me, as you said. I'm with the um, Phoebe Waterman Haas Public Observatory. Um, and the topic of women in astronomy is near and dear to our hearts. Uh, so I started off off the bat with a picture of Phoebe. Um, Phoebe Waterman Haas was one of the first women to get a PhD in astronomy here in the United States of America. She received her PhD in 1913 from Berkeley. I say one of the first because there were two women in her class. And they both received their PhD the same week, which was a really amazing experience. This is a picture of her. Um, actually uh, at work uh, and she seemed like a really great character. We're actually named after Phoebe at our observatory. So here is the picture that was on the AHSP website of me in front of the Phoebe Waterman Haas Public Observatory and we're really excited uh, to be able to not only have an observatory downtown in the middle of Washington DC, I know it sounds crazy, um, <laughs> but it's where the people are and that was our motto is to put the, um, the telescopes where the people are. And so every day we're doing the work that I'm going to talk about um, here today in my presentation um, uh, just by having her name on the observatory and with all the outreach that we do. Um, so it's not only near and dear to our heart because we're named after Phoebe, the topic of women in astronomy, um, but it's also something that we take an active role in researching um, and uh, being a part of in this bigger conversation. Um, and so uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about all that today, the context for this conversation in, um, about women in astronomy. I'm going to talk about the stories and the work of five women in astronomy um, throughout time and ways to become better advocates for women in astronomy that we can all take away. Um, I'm really excited because all of you chose to be here today, so I already know that you're interested, hopefully, in becoming better advocates. Um, so I'm really excited to discuss that all with you as well. So here's what we'll be exploring today. So I wanted to start off the bat. Who can name a woman who is an astronomer? Caroline Herschel. Awesome, yes. Caroline Herschel, any others? It's okay if you can, it's great if you can. What's oh, Rebecca Lundgren? <laughs> there we go. All right, this is great. So I, I knew I was coming to the right audience. I knew that people would be able to answer this question a little bit. But the fact that we're not able to answer this question all the time, and most people off the street are not able to answer this question at all, is really concerning. There are a lot of names out there that we should know. Uh, this is just a sampling, and we're going to talk about a few of the names that are in here. Um, and uh, I love word, word clouds, so <laughs> I thought this would be a good way uh, to be able to look at all the people um, that we are unable to name. Um, and that's due to a few factors. Uh, so when we're, looking, when we're talking about women in astronomy, um, this is actually data, this is current data. Um, this is from 2015 of women who do work in STEM fields. Um, this is a conversation that is very timely because even though uh, women, are en uh, women of all types are entering these fields at a higher rate than usual, it's still a very skewed 
uh, workforce when you look at it um, finally. So this is, uh, we're looking here at psychology, life sciences, physical sciences, computing and mathematics, architecture and engineering, and STEM overall. Astronomy is not specifically on this list because compared to these other fields, astronomy is a smaller field. Um, so this data was compiled looking at the larger fields in general. But as you can see, there's a huge discrepancy between those who identify as women, women and those who identify as men um, being in these fields. So this is a really important conversation to have. And it's always been an important conversation to have too because this statistic has almost always been true. Um, so why is this true? To set up the context before we um, dive into our women today, um, uh, these are a few of the reasons uh, that we are having this conversation at all and why this has been a problem for a very long time. Um, the first I'm going to talk about is gender stereotyping and biases. Actually, before I begin on this, I want to um, tell you that this research um, that we're looking at has been compiled over the last few years by a fantastic group of interns that we've had at the museum that are named the Engaging Girls in STEM interns. Um, so we're actively doing this e research, we're actively doing this work, and we're doing the outreach on the floor of the museum um, to combat that statistic. Uh, so the, this comes out straight out of their research, and I was really excited to present it with you guys today because they've been working really hard on this for the last few years. Um, so with uh, the first uh, problem faced by women in STEM, both currently and in the past, is gender stereotypes and biases. Um, this includes implicit biases, so things that happen involuntarily that we don't mean to do, th that, we m that might um, not seem malicious or overt, but happen anyway. Um, this also includes things, you've probably all heard of gender roles. Um, and things like that. So this includes gender, um, gender roles and stereotyping things such as STEM or science or astronomy as masculine and maybe the humanities or poetry as feminine. Um, these are all things that have happened throughout history and will be pop popping up in the stories of the women we'll talk about and in their work too. Um, the second is inflexible education settings. Often education has been um, a privilege of a certain group of people um, and so by not having that access it's a big problem in um, being part of a world where that has been the accessible point. So either what needs to change is access to that education or um, doing away with that as being the accessible point into that field. And uh, we can talk about that later too if you'd like. That's a whole other rabbit hole. <laughs> um, the next one's fixed mindsets, the idea of genius. So who here has heard of Albert Einstein? <laughs> Albert, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there we go. So I love Albert Einstein. Um, I think he was a fantastic person for the field of astronomy. Um, without a lot of his work and a lot of his colleagues' work, um, we wouldn't be able to think about the universe in, that, in a similar way. Um, with people like Albert Einstein, with people like Isaac Newton, um, people anywhere in all fields, uh, sometimes they're typed as genius, that their ability was born, and things like that, um, which, uh, based on uh, research that might come to light that that might be the truth. But based on current research, um, the idea of the growth mindset instead of fixed mindset, so the, that ability can be learned, that intelligence is malleable, um, is what um, researchers are finding to actually be true. Um, and so by having the mindset that you, that you don't have the talent for math, so you can't do it, has actually inhibited a lot of people. And that includes um, women and other minorities who have not found STEM accessible to them. Finally, um, the problem faced by women in STEM is erasure. Not being talked about, uh, not being documented, uh, not being included. Um, and so even in conversations, uh, maybe not even in be being included um, in the same room uh, uh, with other people. So all of, these th all of those things uh, lead to us not being able to talk about them. We're not being able to name them later in conversation. So it's really important um, that we uplift everyone and talk about them. These are systemic problems. They're not some, uh, a lot of these are not uh, malicious or, uh, or overt, like I said before. We're not, set a, not a lot of people are set out to do these things to people, um, especially when women and other minorities uh, that uh, uh, face these problems. Um, a lot of them are underlying and inherent and permeate society. And so this is a really tough problem that we have. Um, so I'm excited that we're all here today to help face it. All right. So with that all in mind, we're going to be exploring the lives of these five women who uh, have existed throughout time, um, who are all in astronomers in some way, shape, or form. Um, and we're going to be, I'll also be mentioning how they fit into the larger context of the conversation. I'll also be talking about their work and how we, talk about, we can talk about them on the floor of our, our museum when we're doing outreach, things like that. Yeah? Um, 
Mm-hmm. Oh. Great question. I have not personally done that research. I know the reports exist, um, and I can actually probably pull that information up for you after this presentation, because um, the researchers at our museum, those interns, have looked into that as well. Um, our focus um, is the people who come through our museum's doors, which are um, based on our evaluations, a majority of them are from the United States. Um, and so I think that's why the focus has been on the US labor reports. But you're exactly right that um, everyone th needs to be involved and needs to be part of the context. Thank you. Any other questions before we go on? Okay. All right, so these are the five women we'll be talking about today. Obviously, there are a ton more um, <laughs> that I could talk about. And so I encourage you, if you have questions about anybody um, that you didn't see on this list or we didn't talk about today, feel free to ask me. I might know about them, I might not. Um, feel free to look people up that you saw. I can show you that word, that name caught again. If you see somebody's name, you're like, who is that? What did they do? I recommend looking them up. That's how we um, combat these problems as well, is just by making sure we know this information. Um, so uh, finally, I'm going to add a caveat in here. Uh, as you have probably noticed, I didn't choose the most famous women astronomers. I didn't choose Annie Jump Cannon. I didn't choose Henrietta Swan Leavitt. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. Um, but the main reason is because a lot of people already know about them. Uh, there's a lot of people who do amazing work um, that isn't known about just because we're not talking about them. Um, and so just because they weren't the first or the, ground, the most groundbreaking uh, doesn't mean they, get, they don't deserve to be talked about any less. And each one of these women astronomers um, has made amazing contributions to the field. So I'm really excited to um, help uplift their work today. All right, so let's go back in time. Um, does anybody have an idea uh, how far back we can go thinking about women in astronomy? couple thousand years? Anybody have a name they might associate with that? There's, a, there's one famous name. Yeah, Hypatia. Hypatia, Hypatia. Um, she was an, a, an ancient Greek philosopher, astronomer. She taught, um, and she, uh, she was very popular for her time. Because she's so famous, I'm not going to talk about her today. Um, but women in astronomy have existed in some way, shape, or form for thousands of years. We're going to fast forward a little bit in time to the 9th and 10th century. Um, so after um, different revolutions had happened all over the world in astronomy the first time, a few thousand years ago, there was another sort of renaissance in the past 2,000 years of knowledge. And that included uh, knowledge in kind of the uh, Middle e what we call now the Middle East. Um, so the Arabic uh, speaking nations that were over there, um, as well as others, uh, were really interested in astronomy for a few reasons. So they built uh, religious, societal, and otherwise. And so they built tools like this. Has everybody here um, seen a tool like this before? Who has not? It's okay if you haven't. Yeah, that's great. That's great. No, I was excited. I was like, oh, I hope there's one person. So these are two objects from our museum. They're the oldest things in our museum, too. And this is an astrolabe and a celestial globe. Um, so both of them are built as tools um, to be able to not only look at the stars, um, but to use the stars um, to be able to determine some things like time and from that position uh, and other information as well. I actually have one of our outreach astro astrolabes right here. You guys can actually pass it around. Um, and I, anybody who wants to learn how to use it, we can do that later too. Uh, they're a lot of fun. But the astrolabe, it was like an uh, old smartphone. Uh, you basically, if you knew a star in the sky and you knew what day it was and what month, you could input that information, uh, find out some, uh, the uh, altitude of the star in the sky, input that too, and figure out um, uh, different information from that. And so it was a really important tool uh, for figuring out the, those things. Now, a lot of people built these tools because they were so important. There were larger workshops. There were people who were very important when building them. And one of those people was al -Ajida. Now. This is just one name, probably a last name, and it's all the, uh, the, we don't have a lot of information about Alagia. But what we do know is that Alagia is described as the daughter of somebody. And so we can um, probably pretty confidently think that she was a woman and maybe identified as a woman um, based on that description of her. So this is the only line of information that we have of her, period. 
This is all the information we have, is this line of text from a, bi a biographical book written during that time um, by um, Ibn al-Nadim. And it was about uh, different sciences during the time period. And so he listed a bunch of famous engineers and famous builders and all different topics. And one line said, Alagia al-Astralabi, um, the daughter uh, who was his daughter, she, he had before described um, her father, um, who was with Saif al Dawa, which was um, the royal court at the time in Aleppo, um, and student to Bitalis, who was a famous astrolabe maker at a time. So this is all we have. Um, when going back to that problem of erasure, this is part of the problem. We only have one line about this person. We have no contextualizing information. We can guess based on her last name um, where she might have come from uh, in, in an area around Aleppo um, and was uh, now Syria. We can guess based on who her father was and guess based on um, where she worked, uh, what the environment was like. But because there's no more documentation, we don't know anything else. We don't even know what she looked like, though if you research her online, people have ascribed the name Mariam to her. People have drawn beautiful pictures. Um, and so we can make these guesses, but we don't have the information. And so writing down that information, it's key to make, help, helping face these problems. Um, so th that is al Ajilia. Anybody have any questions? No? Feel free to ask them uh, anytime you have them. So we're going to move. Yeah? It says she was an astrolabe maker. Mm hmm. How do you know she wasn't just a craftsperson and was, in some sense, an astronomer and added value to the product? You're exactly right. We don't know. We, we, you have no idea. We, the uh, section of the, biograph um, the biographical text uh, uh, that was written is about astrolabe makers who contributed to astronomy in this court. And so we have that contextualizing information from this section. Um, but that also really, that actually brings up a really good point about what a contribution is in astronomy. Um, traditionally, a contribution um, and tradition within our society as it's been constructed now has been that you have a, an interest in astronomy and maybe add something else to it theoretically or you do research or something like that. Um, but oftentimes, the people who contributed to astronomy um, were the people who were just making the tools. So maybe being a telescope maker in this time was enough to get her listed, under, or a astrolabe maker, was enough to get her listed under the section of astronomy in this book. So thinking about the ways people contribute is a really good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Also, don't you think it's kind of groundbreaking that she was put into a book naming a bunch of engineers and amazing astronomers and amazing engineers that helped contribute to these sort of new technologies? in the 9th and 10th century in the Middle East. And the fact that she's even mentioned shows that she was actually a really important figure, I would think. I hope so. You're, I'm, again, you're adding the right things to it, I would think. Maybe, hopefully, those are all <laughs> good terms because we don't actually know. Um, so th those are all really good points. So let's move forward a bit. Um, past the, uh, uh, the rest of the Middle Ages in Europe, um, the rest of that a golden age um, in the Middle East. There was also fantastic astronomical ex um, discoveries and experiences happening all over the world at that point. Um, and of course, there is little documentation of women being part of it, but there is documentation of those astronomical experiences as a whole. We can talk about the history of astronomy also after if you want to as well. Um, but we're going to move forward to another part of the world in China in the Qing period to Washingyi. Um, this is an artist's rendition of Washingy. Um, th they, there's a lot of artists who love um, to paint these figures um, or draw these figures. Um, and she was part of an affluent family in the Qing Dynasty who really wanted her to do whatever she wanted to do. Her grandfather and her father um, were both accomplished um, uh, men and had huge libraries, and they were like, read all the books, uh, do anything you want. They supported her interests in medicine, they in supported her interests in philosophy, they supported her interests in mathematics and in astronomy. So she actually became a published author uh, during this time period, and she was described during her time period as one of the greatest minds ever to come out of China, which was pretty amazing, and that was by a male author. Um, who was writing about her. Um, so she, she became really important in her field. So um, what did she do that was so important in astronomy um, in the King period? Well, she uh, did everything, pretty much. She wrote treatises on the dispute of the equinoxes. So she was able to predict um, the way the procession of the equinoxes worked. She looked at how we measure how far stars are 
from the Earth. And she also modeled a lot of things. So we use models, of course, um, today and have in the past to, to think about things that we can't conceptualize in our brains. And this, again, is another drawing, and I'm sorry that it's not the greatest um, in terms of quality. Um, but it shows one of her uh, models to model a solar eclipse, which I thought would be fitting um, for our experience this year. So she set up a round table um, and had a light and a mirror. And using those three things, she modeled the way that everything would move um, here with the Earth, the Sun, and the Moon um, to show an eclipse. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I've done a lot of research on Washington and I cannot figure out how she moved those three things to show how an eclipse happens. But I was able to dig up a little bit of her treatise and she does describe it accurately and how to predict them accurately. So however she moved that, she was able to figure out how that worked. She also was um, very proficient in mathematics and so she was able to use her knowledge in mathematics as well to model things. So we're still doing that. Um, this is a model from the Exploratorium of the 2017, in association with the 2017 eclipse and how eclipses work. So we're still doing this today. Yeah. I don't. That's something I wasn't able to find. But it's called The Dispute of the Longitude of the, Star the Stars, was the, tech, the treatise that she wrote. Um, the Dispute of the Longitude of the Stars. She was interested in position, but she was also interested in distance. Um, was the ha is the way I've, I've, I've heard it described. I wasn't able to find much more about it, um, and I'm actually still searching for an English translation of, all the, of the entire text where her treatises were compiled. Um, so I haven't been able to find that yet. I'm excited, I'm hope hoping that it, it exists, or if not, I can pay for a translation <laughs> um, of that to happen. Yep. I'm not sure. We'll find out. I'll let you, I'll, you'll be the first to know when I find the translation of her treatise. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Anybody has the answer? Yes. So she, had, she would have read those. The, her, the library that her grandfather owned that she actually inherited was international. So she was reading treatises from all over the world. She also had commentary on the Pythagorean theorem. Um, and she, was a, she wrote texts to not only address that, but help make it digestible for other readers. She was really interested in doing the same thing I'm interested in doing, um, helping people understand hard concepts. She may, that's exactly my thought. Um, so she was, really, she was really interested in all this stuff. And I, I want to go back here one moment. This is her timeline. She was born in 1768 and died in 1797. She was only 29 years old when she passed away. So she did all of this before she turned 29. I don't want to perpetuate the genius stereotype, remember? Growth mindset's in here, not fixed. Um, but she worked hard to be able to do all of this. This was all of her time, um, which is really exciting and cool to see. If you put your mind to it, you can literally do anything, it seems. And Washington is a fantastic example of that. So not only was she writing treatises about pretty much every subject, um, that, uh, but she was also um, an accomplished poet. And not only was she an accomplished poet, but in her poetry, she wrote about the way she did her work in relation to the society around her. So these are two excerpts, two different parts of um, writing. Um, this is from uh, an actual poem. And then this is a kind of like, uh, it was along with her poetry. But she said, it's made to believe women are the same as men. Are you not convinced daughters can also be heroic? So she was making commentary on the time, um, that period that she lived in, and recognized that whatever she was doing was different than what, of, what else was happening for other women in her society. Um, and so often when described in literature, Washin Yi is often said that she was bucking societal norms or that um, she was able to defy the odds. Um, whatever, uh, th those are all ascribed to her, um, but these are the real ways she felt about how she was in, um, interacting with society. And so this last statement um, has her saying, I have traveled 10,000 li and read 10,000 volumes. Bold is my attempt to surpass men. So she just, rec she recognized her position. She recognized the challenge um, and she wrote about it um, a lot in her writings as well. Now, Washington Yi, to put her in that broader context again, she has been written about, which is fantastic. So she's, uh, there is a little bit more documentation about her. I have no pictures of her, and it's hard to find her work. Um, but she had access to education. 
Um, and uh, she had that supportive uh, growth, it seems like growth mindset, if I ascribe that to the situation, um, uh, family that really was interested in supporting her and helping her get to the place where she needed to be. So here's an example of a success story um, in keeping somebody within the track of astronomy as opposed to somebody dropping out. Anybody have any questions about watching you? All right, I'll let you all know when I get the rest of her work. We'll find out if she did figure out parallax. All right, so let's fast forward a little bit more. We're gonna come all the way back to the United States of America um, to somebody you, who here has heard of Cecilia Pankapashkin? If you haven't, it's okay. All right, awesome. I, I was hoping to pick people you hadn't heard of before or not many of you had. But Cecilia it, um, became an astronomer in an era when women in the United States were just becoming, uh, getting access to astronomy. Now I want to put in the caveat there that it wasn't all women. Cecilia Pankapashkin um, was part of, a, a part of the demographic, <laughs> as I, I guess I could say, um, that had access to education, that was encouraged to study, um, and most of them were upper, to upper middle class to upper class white women. And so th it's a very specific subset of women, but we're really lucky to have them because they did um, lay the groundwork for a lot of astronomers that came after them in the 20th century. Who do you think I'm talking about and um, who also worked in the same time period as Cecilia? A few of you named them earlier. Annie Jump Cannon, Henrietta Swan Leavitt, they all worked at the same place that Cecilia did, Harvard University. Um, you probably, um, or you might have heard a lot recently about human computers, especially um, with hidden figures coming out. It became uh, the thing to then look, go back even farther than Katherine Johnson um, and think about women who came before, who did a lot of these mathematical computations, who did a lot of the research, did a lot of the data collecting, and have not been talked about a lot. So it's really great that these names are out there and, and that a lot of us know them already. The, yeah. The late 19th and early 20th century is that astronomy was considered one of the few scientists which was proper for a proper young baby to study. You're bringing up a really good point. The, the propriety, the, 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 the stereotyping, uh, going back to those gender stereotypes and everything, um, going back to what is proper for somebody to do. Astronomy was definitely, astronomy um, and biology. Uh, and mm -hmm. And geology. Mm -hmm. and astronomy in particular, because it was one of the muses, mm -hmm. classical Greek, like dance and music and uh, art. And for some reason, the Greeks put it in with that. And in the neoclassical revolution at the end of the 19th century, right. it was OK for women to study astronomy. Yep. So here we have describing gender and stereotypes to Greek muses, and then, <laughs> right, exactly. And, and, and some of them went on to do real research. Exactly. It wasn't just the genteel, oh, this is Jupiter and this is Mercury. It was, you can do science. Exactly. So uh, you're exactly right. Many of them went much farther, and we're going to talk a little bit about Cecilia's work as well. Um, and she, she did a lot of great work that we still use today. It was very influential during her time. Um, Cecilia came over from England, so she wasn't born here in America. Um, she was born into um, a wealthy family. Her father was an accomplished barrister, among other things. He actually did a lot. Um, and he passed away young. Her mother raised her um, alone. Uh, this is great. Do you hear how much I'm able to say about her? by the way, we know a lot about Cecilia. Um, a lot of people asked her questions while she was still alive and were like, tell us more about your life. So there's a lot of great interviews with her autobiographies before her death in 1979 that I'm able to pull on. Um, so again, documentation is key. So she came over to the United States actually to pursue a PhD. She met Harlow Shapley in England and he's like, I'm starting a graduate program at Harvard. Do you want to join me? And, and she, was, she wanted to take that opportunity because she really loved astronomy at that point. She'd been encouraged from a young young age to read as much as possible, and so she had, um, was already very interested. So she was, uh, she actually uh, published her PhD thesis um, right here um, in 1925, because she came over in 1923. So she did this research very quickly, um, and was one of the first people to get a PhD from Radcliffe College there at Harvard University as well. Um, and from Harlow Shapley's inaugural, inaugural program. So her research um, was interested in stellar atmospheres. Now, actually, you've, George, set me up well today talking about the sun and what we do and what we don't know, <laughs> um, which has been the case pretty much all the entire time we've been looking at the sun. There's a lot we don't know and we're trying to figure it out as time goes on. 
Um, now, with the sun, the, at the time, the idea was that the sun itself, the light that we get, the lights that emit, that's emitted from the surface and the atmosphere, was made out of the same stuff we have here on the crust of the Earth. Um, and so they were looking at this, yep, they were looking, <laughs> what? I know, we, well, this is science. We think about something, we test the theory, we figure out it's not true, and then we think, those guys were crazy. Don't worry, somebody will think we're crazy someday. So that's the beauty of science. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, this didn't seem, this didn't drive with Cecilia. She knew a few of the um, influential physicists at the time, knew their work, knew their mathematics, and decided to apply the idea of um, thermal ionization um, to the understanding of uh, the atmosphere of the sun. So what that basically means is that when looking at the sun in different temperatures, Cecilia noticed that the energy that you were seeing, that um, light or color that you were seeing, looked different depending on what temperature it was. Um, so this is actually the spectrum of hydrogen. And these are different classes of stars, um, just for reference, and temperatures. And as you can see, the way that it's being emitted changes based on the temperature, based on the ionization. So the excitement of those electrons, the electrons jump up to one shell, fall down to another, sometimes they're kicked off. Um, and we can talk about that more later. I know George can talk about that all day um, as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, and so this is something that people hadn't thought about. The surface of the sun, um, five, about 6,000 degrees Kelvin, and it was emitting in one wavelength. What would happen? Um, uh, and, and so they were measuring all the particles on the sun based on just that. So sh what she did was by thinking about the fact that different particles can emit differently in different temperatures, she applied that to the atmosphere of the sun and realized that the amount of hydrogen that was there and the amount of hydrogen that could be there if it started emitting at other temperatures was a lot more than what people thought about. So much more that now hydrogen makes up most of what the sun is made out of. Um, and so her research was published, like I said, in 1925. And this was the foreword, written by Harlow Shapley, no less. People were like, this is speculative. Eh, you might not want to believe it. Most people thought this was a little out there uh, during her time. Now, this is me ascribing my idea to this, but I think that might have been in part because she was a woman doing this research. However, we don't know that. Um, because a few years later, this was taken um, as, as truth as people started doing the experiments, doing the math themselves, and figuring this out for themselves as well. Um, and so I'm speculating on the speculation um, about why uh, she, this wasn't accepted off the bat, uh, but you never know. She went on to become uh, the chair of astronomy uh, there at Harvard. She went on to teach for a very long time, wrote many books, published many papers. She was very successful in her own right at Harvard University, and she stayed there her entire career, um, which is really exciting as well. So Cecilia Payne-Kapashkin um, is a really great example um, of the astronomy that was happening here in the early 20th century. Anybody have a, oh, and her, um, a uh, fun story about her last name, Gaposhkin. She, she took her husband's last name, hyphenated with her own. Her husband, actually, she helped get over here. I think it wasn't from Russia, but it was a sad, it was from Russia. Um, but she helped him get basically a visa to get in the country. Um, and so they schemed about that for a few years. They got over there, found out they liked each other, and then they got married. <laughs> um, so that's a fun story, side story as well. So at the beginning of the 20, or begin, late of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, was also a really exciting time for telescopes in general and observatories. Um, and so when we uh, look at a map now of the observatories that have been built pretty much since then, they're everywhere. It's a really exciting time. So this is actually not a completely up-to-date map. There are a few observatories on here that have been added in the last like 10 years or so that might not be on here. Um, but this is a map of observatories, both research observatories, um, government-owned, private-owned, um, and a lot of them university-related or education-related settings as well. So there's a lot of observatories all over the world. Um, and uh, we're actually going to talk about for our next astronomer the most remote observatory here on this list. Which one do you which one do you think that might be? Antarctica, Antarctica that's right. Um, right here in Antarctica. Yeah, very remote. So Dome C, um, nicknamed Dome Charlie, Dome Circe, uh, among other things, and the home of the Concordia Station, is right here 
in Antarctica. So not quite to the South Pole, not as bad as other um, stations in Antarctica, which happen to be closer to the South Pole and much higher elevation, just much colder. Um, so it's, it's not too bad um, to, to go to Dome C. And here's a picture of it from up above. It's actually been there since the 1970s. It was originally a military operation and then has been converted to a research station that's run by an international crowd. Um, Back in the 90s, actually, there was interest in, start, in starting um, observing there, astronomy-related observing. And it wasn't until in 2006 when the first crew got there to do the first um, experiments to try and set up the first telescope, and she was one of them. Mariam Shadid is our next astronomer that we're going to talk about, um, and she was born in Morocco. Uh, now, Miriam wanted to be an astronomer also from a really young age, though that's not always the case. Some of us are late bloomers. Um, and uh, she uh, then went to school and uh, studied astronomy, studied the pulsation of stars. So she was really inter interested in um, pulsating stars and stellar evolution. That was part of her theory thesis. She helped build the VLT in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And then when this came up, she's like, well, I've already been to one dry remote place. Time to go to another. <laughs> um, I don't know if she actually said that. I don't want to put words into her mouth. But it sounds like it's, that's what happened. These are actually two pictures of her in Antarctica. She was not only the first woman astronomer in Antarctica, but she was also the first Moroccan in, Ar in Antarctica as well. So she um, ha has been able to achieve a lot and is still working at the University of Nice um, in France. Uh, so she uh, is really, has really uh, made a profound impact in going to these remote places, um, thinking about where we need telescopes, why we need this research, um, and is a really great example of somebody who's worked really hard, um, definitely that growth mindset ability um, to put herself through school and get where she needs to go. The only interview I was able to find for about her um, was in Arabic, and I'm actually still having it translated right now. I have a really wonderful intern whose family speaks um, the type of Arabic that's spoken in Casablanca. Um, and so I, I was learning a little bit about her and a little bit about her. Um, and she, she's just been really interested in this at a young age, but also understood that there were a lot of odds that she faced being a woman um, in astronomy. And so she's done a lot of great work. Um, because of that. Does anybody have any questions about Miriam Shadid? I don't have a watch on me, so I don't know if I'm going over. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yep, she is still alive. You're exactly right. I know. I'm, I, I'm really excited um, within this research, and I'll tell you my ideas about where all this research is going um, when we're, we're finished, but you're exactly right. Um, whenever I see that present, I get really excited because um, there's still work to be done. Any other questions about Miriam? So the last astronomer I'm going to talk about, well, the last thing I'm going to talk about is bring us to the present. So we've talked, we've gone through um, most of the last thousand years. We've talked about instrument making. We've talked about theoretical and mo um, model, ma theoretical physics and model making a little bit. We've talked about um, doing the data collection. We've talked about building observatories. Um, and right now, <laughs> we're t a lot of the research that's being done that's really exciting is in that real theoretical uh, part of astronomy. So not just visual astronomy um, that's still happening, but trying to explore the things we don't know, like dark matter. So does anybody here know what dark matter is? Nope. Good. All right. <laughs> um, I was hoping for that answer. So dar just uh, to review, dark matter, we don't know what it is, but we do know there's something there. So I'm bringing up this picture, and we actually talk about dark matter a little bit at the museum um, uh, in terms of, of Vera Rubin, who's another woman astronomer. Um, but dark matter is something that exists in our universe um, that we can detect because we're able to measure um, how massive groups of galaxies, like in this picture, might be. And we can measure then what their gravitational uh, interaction might be with the stuff around them. But by measuring that and seeing how much they're interacting with the stuff around them, we realize that they're definitely not mass en massive enough to be able to cause something that's so distorted. So here in this picture, there's a galaxy cluster here. And then there's kind of this ring around the outside. That ring is actually all the same stuff, just repeated in a ring that we're seeing around it. We call this gravitational lensing. Basically, this stuff on the outside is behind the galaxy cluster. And the galaxy cluster is lensing the light, or making the light split and bend around it, so that we see it in this kind of odd ring shape around it. Again, we can talk about more about gravitational lensing if you want after this. And I have a little experiment that I brought. I don't know if we have time for it. Um, but if anybody wants to do it with me, we can do that too. Um, but uh, we notice that there's something there 
that we just can't see. It's not luminous, it's not emitting anything, it's not hot. Um, and so they've called it dark matter, basically not real, not other matter. Uh, and so the research that's being done is really interested not in just how it affects space, like we see here, but what is it made out of? And a candidate for what it's made out of is called an axion. Um, or one of them is called an axion. And the astronomer that I'm going to talk about next studies axions, Shonda Prescott Weinstein. Now, something I neglected to say about Mariam Shadid, Mariam is Dr. Mariam Shadid. Um, our, our, and, and Cecilia Payne-Kaposchkin is Dr. Cecilia Payne-Kaposchkin. The great thing um, about those last three astronomers is that they made it through their PhD program um, and that they, they are now doctors, so is Dr. Shonda Prescott Weinstein. And so you can see the transition for women being having access to the normal route of being astronomers, but again, like we talked about earlier, maybe there are other routes as well. So back to Dr. Shonda. Um, Dr. Shonda Prescott Weinstein studies axions, which is a candidate for dark matter. I do not have any pictures to describe what an axion is, because if I showed you something, it'd be a lot of math. Uh, and it's math that I don't understand. And if somebody here wants to talk about it with me and help me understand it, um, I would love that. <laughs> but basically what an axion is, is that it would be a very, very, very um, small light particle. Um, Pseudoscalar is what it would be called. Um, that would exist um, in a state that could decay and Im possibly emit a photon, which is why they're excited about finding it. It could only emit a photon if it was in a place with a really high magnetic field. And so the experiments that people like Dr. Shana are doing and the theoretical um, mathematics that people are doing is looking at that within a, a really char uh, big magnetic field. They also have a really a large instrument at the University of Washington to try to simulate that magnetic field and catch an axion, pretty much. Um, but they haven't found it yet, and it's only just a candidate for dark matter. Again, we can talk a little bit more about what an axion is if you want after this, but I'm not quite sure I can answer any questions. <laughs> yeah? So the idea is that they could catch one. That's the thought. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the tough part about all of this. A lot of it is theoretical. The experiments are hard to do, but they are trying to do it. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, it's, va it's very fascinating physics. It overlaps a lot of different fields, quantum mechanics, um, string theory. Uh, and so Shonda delves into all of those fields um, together. She actually got her PhD in Canada, um, which is a really interesting story as well. Um, I'd recommend going to her website. And um, she, on her website, she has a lot of different interviews that she's done that tells her story about getting her um, PhD and doing her work. Um, and the best way to learn about somebody is for them to talk about it themselves. So that's why I definitely urge all of you to listen to her and about her life. Um, what I th also think is really important about Dr. Chanda is that she's doing the work of inter an intersectional astronomer. Uh, has anybody here ever heard the term intersectional before? That's OK. Um, so basically, the idea of intersectionality is that um, nothing is happening in a vacuum. And there are multiple layers, um, mostly societal um, and sociocultural, that are affecting a person or a situation at any given time. 
And so what Dr. Shonda does, um, and um, she does through a lot of her advocacy and outreach work um, as an astronomer, is understanding being an astronomer um, as a person of color and as a woman um, in astronomy. So she's on a lot of different committees and boards. She does a lot of writing in this. And um, this is a really important, um, I really want to make this point, um, because a lot of the current um, young researchers that are in astronomy and other uh, science fields as well, as well are recognizing this need to recontextualize science as not in a vacuum. Science has always done, been done in the context of the society that it's in. And so not only going back and recontextualizing science historically, but making sure that the science done now is recontextualized as well. So she actually curates a really fantastic list um, called Decolonizing Science, which spans all of history, or she tr um, it definitely tries to, and she's adding to it continuously to provide a really great reading list for those who are interested in this work. Um, so that's how she's able to fit back into our um, context for this conversation. She's doing the work as well as an astronomer and as an activist and an advocate. Does anybody have any questions about Dr. Chanda? No? All right. Definitely check out her website. It's fantastic. All right. So how do we become better advocates? We just learned about these five amazing women. How do we keep this momentum up, learn more, and help other people get excited, uh, people get excited about it too, and maybe inspire other women um, to be part of science and astronomy as well? So going back to our four categories, I'll go through a few of them and um, talk about uh, what we've come up with in our research to help um, kind of close these gaps and face these problems in our own work through astronomy outreach. So to um, start combating gender stereotyping and biases, um, we, uh, our, our interns have done a lot of work to figure out um, that things like bringing, not bringing up negative stereotypes um, about any uh, women in STEM and making sure everyone is included is a really great way to, on the floor, immediately um, combat uh, this problem. With um, inflexible education settings, making sure everything is collaborative, everyone is participating, and making sure that people understand that uh, there is no wrong answer. There's only um, a way to learn um, and grow from any answer that you have um, can help make that education setting flexible. There's also a question of access there, and that's something uh, for a larger conversation that I can have with anyone as well after this. For fixed mindsets, um, for promoting the growth mindset, the idea that you can do it, you just um, need to work on it, um, is to make sure you praise people for all the work that they do and highlight the struggles that scientists have. Not everything comes naturally, and that's the whole idea of a growth mindset. We all have to work hard for what we do, and we work hard in our different ways, too. Not everyone works in the same way. So helping promote that can be really important. Um, to use that an example with astronomy, not everyone can look through a telescope at, for the first time and see something in the eyepiece. Eyepieces can be hard, and they take practice to learn how to use. And so um, we, at the museum, we always encourage people, take a look again. It takes patience. It's okay. For me, the first time I looked through an eyepiece, I couldn't see anything. And so by making sure you're connecting with somebody, making sure that they understand that that struggle that they might be having is valid and real can really help that. And finally, with erasure, something you can do immediately is if there um, is a woman or a girl that is responding um, to a question that you may have or an idea, repeat their words. Um, uplift their information um, it, because it is valid. And highlight stories of successful scientists that you know. That's what I just did today. Um, and I'm hoping to do more of every single day that I'm out there doing my astronomy outreach. Um, so these are all very simple, very quick ways that you can help combat these problems. And then, of course, there are other things you can do as well um, past that to become better advocates for women in astronomy. So that's all I have for you today. I didn't want to go too long. I know it's the last night. Um, so if you have any questions, please let me know. If you have any questions about any other women I didn't talk about, I, I will try to answer. But I'm also in the same boat as you. I'm learning every day. I'm trying to make sure that I can become a better advocate. And so I'm hoping someday I'll know every name on this list and more. And I hope you do too. Thank you so much. Any questions? You guys did a great job at asking them within, which I'm all about. No? And I didn't, I feel bad. I had like a few experiments up here <laughs> that we do on the floor of the museum uh, that relate to each topic that we just talked about. If you all want, does everyone want to see them? I can do them right now. Sure. No? Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I didn't mean to skip over them. Uh, 
Let's see here. All right. So I already saw you, show you the astrolabe with models. We use models all the time at the museum. So Washington Yi um, built a model of the moon and the sun and the earth. We have one too. What, is, what do we call this? Does anybody know? An orrery, yeah. Or it's, I still have trouble with that word. And my, my spell check still doesn't know how to spell it. So um, yeah, it's an ongoing battle. Yeah. It's still an ongoing battle. <laughs> um, and so this orrery is fantastic. Um, we what we use it for is to show the relationship between the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun, and another planet between the Earth and the Sun. This could be Venus, it could be Mercury. This is not to scale. Um, but what, is it, what, <laughs> yeah. um, what it does do is show those relationships and show the orbits. Um, so if we were looking at that other um, object, we'd be looking at the phases. So we often use this when we're observing Venus to think about the phases of Venus and why we're able to see different parts led up. The other thing we can use this for in terms of the solar eclipse that's happening soon is to think about what happens when the sun, uh, the moon goes between the sun and the earth and why it might not always happen. So this is a really great moment to look at it. You can see the tilt of the orbit that the moon has in relation to the sun and the earth. So we use this all the time, so much so that my coworkers are a little mad that I brought it with me. Uh, <laughs> they had to do without it this weekend. Um, but it's a really great tool. Models can um, be used to make a lot of things accessible um, for people who have, might be accessing this information for the first time. And Washington, you knew the valuable value of them as well. Um, I also wanted to show you all, for those of you who hadn't seen, um, our spectrograph in relation to uh, Cecilia Payne Kapashkin. So I had it out on the deck earlier. The sun's not coming out again, I don't think. Oh yeah, I don't think the sun's coming out again today. If it does though, I'll have it out there um, immediately. But our solar spectrograph shows us the spectrum of the sun in real time. It uses a small little dial here to change the size of the diffraction grating that's inside um, to show us the full spectrum of the sunlight that's being diffused through our atmosphere. And so it's a really great way of showing how data can be represented when we're collecting it through astronomy. It's not always looking at the exact image of something. We're not looking at the disk of the sun here, we're just looking at the spectrum. And that's exactly what the people at Harvard Observatory were doing as well and what Cecilia was doing when she was doing our work. So in terms of dark matter, we do an experiment at the museum. You, anybody who's done an experiment with dark matter before has probably seen the cloth and the ball experiment where you put, you take a piece of cloth. Oh, would anybody like to help me? <laughs> Excellent. All right, here you go. I'm going to hand you that. I'm going to take this. And you say this is the universe. Yeah, this is the fabric of space time. It's 2D. We can touch it, we can feel it, we can bend it. Um, and when an object exists in our universe, here's an object, could be anything, this is what it does to space time. It no longer becomes flat, it becomes curved. And remember, this would be in 3D. But the, um, it sh is a great way to show how space time can be affected by massive objects. Now the way we represent gravitational lensing, which is what I was showing to you before, thank you, is by, let's have a round of applause for our volunteer. <laughs> um, is by actually rolling some little balls around them. We call them photons. Um, to show how gravitational lensing works as well. So those are just some examples of small activities that can represent the work th of the women we just talked about in uh, simple ways for those who we're talking to as well. It's always fantastic to connect the lives of these people back to their work so people can contextualize them fully. Yeah. Great question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I normally am not up in front of a class um, talking to you. Uh, I actually am only ever doing this when I'm at star parties, it feels like, or at Novak meetings, which is a fantastic opportunity. Instead, I'm normally on the floor of the museum or out at our observatory doing outreach, kind of like how all of you do outreach at your public nights. Um, and so we, I work full time as an astronomy educator at the Phoebe Waterman Haas Public Observatory. So five days a week we're open, weather permitting. Uh, we'll do these, the, some of these activities can be moved indoors. And so we'll do those if it's raining. If not, we'll be outside with our telescopes. Um, creating these experiences and contextualizing uh, the, the views that we're seeing with historical context um, and the people who are doing the science as well. And so I'm, I'm honestly, if I'm not doing paperwork, which you know we all have that uh, to do, is I'm out on the floor every day working with visitors. So my, I, I actually have never done a summer camp, but I mean, we're open to anything as long as we get to talk about all this. <laughs> 
got another comment. One yeah. of the names on your name cloud was Sarah Hill. Yes. And, um, and when I was at Moses, she was a professor of astronomy and learned a little bit of her background. Um, and I think it may, have been, it may have been typical of some of the women of the early 20th century yeah. in that either having had a doctorate of astronomy or getting close to getting one, became involved in war work. Yes. And as a, most of them as computers. Yep. But I know Cecilia Pinga was, mm -hmm. was, her husband was also. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Sarah Hill was. Sarah worked, she didn't know at the time that she was working on the Manhattan Project. Yep. They didn't tell her what she was working on. But I think some of that experience probably may have been liberating, as it was to many women who got out of the home. In the case of people who had doctors, they realized they could make significant contributions. And, I think there were a whole of those and other people realized they could make significant contributions right. through that work. Right. It, I think they knew already. <laughs> right. It helped open up channels at the high end of For sure. For sure. The other observation, in the case of Sidney Payton, the Pashka, the Boca Lero also, a lot of these women who were the same half of a husband and wife team, because there were a lot of astronomers who were the especially in the Interesting observation. <laughs> and, and, and just about every case I had ever heard of, the woman was the one who was the level headed one. Um, I worked with Gerard the Bocaler in Texas, uh -huh. and his wife was much more pleasant than he was. They seemed to be able to tolerate each other, and they very often bop bop and talk and bop with each other. They, um, they work well together and were much more productive together than probably either one would have been by themselves. There's fantastic examples of that throughout history. Caroline Herschel is one of them. She's only ever termed an assistant. She was an astronomer in her own right, and she worked um, with William to do a lot of those observations and did a lot of that herself, too. So, Any other questions, Any comments, questions? concerns? I'm here for concerns, too. <laughs> I have, I have. I was a really clear night. I actually was down at the Winter Star Party, um, and I was like, I'm going to try this. I think Sirius was the star I chose. And it, the aperture is just not big enough. It's, it's teeny. You can come see it after. It's teeny tiny. I was not able to do it. I w I've been able to shine bright um, lights from indoors on in through it, and I'm able to see a little bit. Um, but it's really, it's meant for really, really bright light. Maybe the brightest one that we know of uh, in the sky. So, <laughs> no, but that, I, I tried. <laughs> yeah, for sure. We've looked at fluorescent lights. We looked at a lot of fun stuff. Actually, I think when I came, I brought it to the Novak meeting in November, and I think we did try to do that, which was kind of fun. When you said you were doing research with yeah. people who attend the museum, what, what form was the research in? Was this perceptions of the impediments to women? Awesome question. So a little bit of background on research, and I actually just realized I was supposed to talk about where, where this is going a little bit, too, um, in terms of the research. Um, but we, a few years ago, um, got great funding for um, us to have an internship every summer to do research in engaging girls in STEM um, fields. And so a lot of the research that's been done is research um, on in the academic um, side of things and uh, other publications. So a lot of this data comes from research that's been done by larger institutions. It's also coupled with research of evaluation on the floor of different situations. Th that includes observational research, so observing the way interactions take place and evaluating them um, later with experts, and also asking um, questions um, and having infor informational interviews after interactions as well. So all that's been brought together, um, uh, and all that data has been brought together and analyzed um, over the last few years um, to come up with the ideas you saw today, and it's still being um, changing and evolving and being researched as well. We're by no means done with any of this. Um, to go one step further, you mentioned Mariam Shadid's still alive. And so something that I'm really interested in as um, a former historian as well, somebody who really likes to record information, um, is that the best way to do uh, all of this is to talk to these people as long as they're still alive. Um, the best way to learn about somebody is through their own words. And so the more of their words we get down, the better we get to know them. And so Miriam um, luckily does have interviews done of her. A lot of it is in Arabic. So things that I, I still am looking into um, because I unfortunately 
unfortunately don't speak Arabic. Um, but um, she also does speak French. She hasn't done as many interviews in French. Um, a lot of them were, at, I found a lot of interviews actually um, through Al Jazeera in Arabic, which is really fantastic. Um, and I'm really excited about that too because there's a, fan, um, a whole world of Arabic speakers out there who deserve to know just as much as we do um, how, what her achievements have been. So I'm really excited about that. Um, but you brought up a really good point. I, I think we have an amazing opportunity here that we can't pass up. So that's what I'm interested in doing personally with the research going forward. How does your work relate to the work done by the Committee of the World Women in Astronomy, the Pardon? Oh, uh, the Committee. Um, so a lot of the research that um, has been done and a lot of the, the things that I use in my own work comes out of that committee or comes out of members of that committee who are doing offshoot work as well. That the committee, um, on, uh, the w committee on Women in the AAS is really active um, and they had I think their own conference a year ago, um, I believe, that convened and was a very large convening as well. Um, and so they're very active, they're very interested in this topic, they're very interested in intersectional astronomy and intersectional science because um, it's just as important, if not more, um, uh, to make sure everyone's included. This is not just about women. Right. So, so here, so I guess going um, back to statistics, there are some like m micro situations that have fantastic statistics. When you look at larger, the larger, the broader picture, and um, you look at the statistics for that though, it, it's still abysmal. So you're right, um, for WAS they've been doing fantastic work and tr making sure they become a more equitable um, organization. But the work's not done there. A lot of this work has to be done in places like academia, um, where women are not making it to facu faculty or tenured positions. And a lot of the reasons we talk of why are why are what we talked about today. And so um, the work still needs to be done. And it's good that an organization like that is working on it. Any other questions? Yes. So <laughs> Right. Thank you. Thank you.